Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem number of ways to form a target string given a dictionary. So we're given a list of words where each of the words is of the same length. So something like this. And we're also given a target word. So let's say in this case, our target word is ABA. You can read through the description, but it's definitely overly complicated in my opinion. The problem is pretty simple. We're trying to build this target word character by character. So we are first trying to get the A character. We can get that character from any of these input words. So for example, we could take this lowercase a, great. The problem is when we take a character, so we took this character to match this one. Now we are gonna be looking for the next character. The problem is we took this character, but now not only can we not reuse this character, we actually can't use any character from the same index as the character that we already used. So now we can't use this B and we can't use this C. Alternatively, we could have actually not chosen this A. We could have, when we were trying to match this A, we could have chosen a different A. We could have chosen this A or maybe even this A. The problem is when we choose one of these characters farther to the right, we can not only not reuse this character and the same character from the other words, like the same position from the other words, but we also can't use anything to the left of the character that we already use. So we can't use this and we can't use anything to the left of it. Same with every other word. So that's the restriction here. And that might make you think, well, if we ever wanna even be able to build this word, we better have these words have a length that's at least equal to this one. I don't know if there's a guarantee about that, but that's just like a small observation that you might make. So what's one possible way that we could build this word? Well, we could use this A, which makes it so we can't use these characters anymore. Now we're trying to look for a B. There's no Bs over here. There are some Bs here. We probably wanna pick this one. So let's go ahead and do that. Now we can't use these characters. And now we're lastly looking for another A. We have actually a couple of choices. We could do this one or do this one. Let's just do this one. And now we've matched the target. So that's one way we could build the target word. And in this problem, we are trying to count the number of ways we could do it. So this will kind of make you think, let's try a brute force approach. Let's try to count every single way manually, maybe with backtracking, but definitely with recursion, because kind of like the last example showed, for this last character, we could have a branch where we choose this character. We could have a branch where we choose this character. And by then we would realize we've reached the end of the target string. So both of those are gonna be based cases, both of those are going to be branches. Each of them is going to return one. This branch counted one way to build this word. This branch, maybe using this character, counted another way to build this word. And if you can honestly get the brute force solution, that is getting pretty close to solving this problem. There are probably multiple ways to brute force this. Well, there definitely are. The challenge is to do it intelligently so that we can apply caching to the problem. And to be honest, you never know if you can actually do caching or not until you actually try to brute force the problem and try to figure out which parameters you are going to pass into that recursive function. I usually call the recursive function DFS. You can call it whatever you'd like. Some people call it DP, or maybe you can give it a long name. It doesn't really matter but what parameters are we gonna be passing in? Well, a couple of the obvious ones are gonna be, what index are we at in the target word because we are going character by character to build the target word. Let's call that index I because that's kind of the most important one. We can't really move to the next character unless we've matched this character. So in our DFS, that's going to be one variable. And luckily in our list of words, we only need one variable. They call it K in this problem. So that's what I'm gonna be using as well. But we only need one variable because this K will tell us the position we're at in every single word because anytime we use a character, we can't use any characters to the left of it for every single word. So K is gonna make things pretty easy for us. And initially it's also gonna be at zero to start with just like I. K 
is going to be our second variable, and that's actually all we really need. We don't really need to keep track of anything else. Okay, so given that, how do we even brute force this problem before we even think about caching? How do we brute force it? Well, it's all about thinking about what are our choices. That's what it's about. What choice do we have when we're trying to find a matching character for this? We're looking for a A character. We're at this position in all of our words. So our choice here is let's try to look at every single word. Does this word have a lowercase a at index k? Yes, it does. So that's kind of a possibility. Does this have a lowercase a? It does not. So that's not a possibility. This one also does not have a lowercase a. So we really only have one choice here. And when we take this choice, how are our parameters going to be updated? Well, let's say we started at index zero, i is at index zero, and let's say our k is also at index zero. Well, when we go here, we're definitely going to be incrementing our i because we did find a match, so that would be one, and we're also going to be incrementing our k because we used the character at index k, so now we can't use anything to the left of it, so now k is going to be one. Now, this is not a great example to figure this little trick out, but Think about it this way. What if there had been a lowercase a over here too? There was a lowercase a. What would our other branch look like? Well, i would be incremented by one and our k over here would also be incremented by one. So what I'm saying is whether we use the character from this string or this string or this string, as long as we use the character at index k, our parameters are going to be the same. We're going to increment i by one. It's going to be one. We're going to increment k by one. It's also going to be one. So why do we even have to call this twice? We don't need to call it twice. Why not just call it once and multiply the result? result by two like this. Take this and then just multiply it by two. By this, I mean like the recursive call and the return value is going to be multiplied by two. That's pretty obvious and simple, but how is that going to help us? Because within our recursive DFS function, aren't we still going to have to loop through every word? See, okay, does this have a matching character? Yes, it does. That's one. Does this have a matching character? No. So we're still at one. This also doesn't have a matching character. So we're still at one. Maybe though this did and this would have been two. Whatever that value is, we still have to loop through every word and look at the character at position K, don't we? So even if we apply caching to this problem, the overall time complexity is going to be the length of target, let's call that T, and the length of each input word, let's call that K. And then for each DFS call, we're going to have to loop through every word anyway. Even if we apply memoization to this, this would be the time complexity with memoization. And then multiplying that by looping through each word is going to be, let's say, k squared. Or actually not k squared. It's going to be the number of words. Let's call that w. So this is going to be the overall time complexity. That's actually not bad, but it will get time limit exceeded on leak code. So there is another trick we're going to have to do. And basically, it's going to be pre-computing the count of each character at each position. So basically, we're going to say how many lowercase a characters are there at position zero among all of the words? How many lowercase b characters are there, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to go through each position, get the count of each character. And then within our DFS, we're not going to need a loop inside that DFS. So then the overall time complexity of the DFS will become the length of the target word. That was T and the length of each input word that was K. So that's going to be the overall time complexity of our DFS. If we apply caching, I'm kind of assuming that you know the technique caching, because if you don't, this problem is definitely hard. We've solved many problems using this technique, including the previous problem that we solved yesterday. Okay, this is the time complexity of our DFS. We improved that, but we remember, we still do have to do that pre-computation among all of the words. We have to get the count of each character. That's not going to be too bad. That's going to be the length of each word times the number of words. Words. Let's say that's W times K. And these two terms are not going to be multiplied together. They're going to be added together because first we're going to do the pre-computation and then we're going to do our DFS with caching. So this becomes the overall time complexity. So that's kind of the trick. This is a pretty standard dynamic programming problem. 
You can solve it with caching, but the trick here is that we have to do some pre-computation before that. That's kind of what separates this from like a medium dynamic programming problem into a hard problem. So now let's code it up. Okay, so one thing I didn't mention is that our result, since we're counting the number of ways, it could be a really big number. And basically we just want to take that number and mod it by this value. This is 10 to the power of nine plus seven. That was a part of the problem description. I just didn't really talk about it too much. Now we want to go through every word in our input words and get that pre-computation. Let me actually create the data structure I'm gonna use for that. You could use a two dimensional array and that would probably be a tiny bit more efficient, but it doesn't really change the overall time complexity. So I'm gonna use a hash map, which is a default dict in Python. The value here is gonna be an integer. Making it a default dict makes it so that the value is initialized to zero regardless of which key we have. What we're doing here is mapping the index of the word and the character of the word to the count of that character among all the words. So you'll see what I mean as we do it, but we're going through every single word. Then we're gonna go through every character in the word. We also wanna keep track of the index because we're gonna need that. We need to know the position of that character. So we can do that like this in Python. When you enumerate a string like W, that basically gives you the index for free and we also get the character. So now with that, we're just gonna say get the count using the index and the character and increment it by one. The index is important because remember when we use a character from a word, we can't use any character to the left of it. So we need to keep track of the index. Next, we are going to do our DFS, our recursive DFS. Two parameters I talked about, I is gonna be the index of the target word. I'm gonna comment that just to make it clear. I is equal to the index of target and K is equal to the index of a word, which let's say words array, J is just some arbitrary word and K, I'm kind of using it as we're gonna be using it. K is gonna be the position of the word. So now our DFS, we didn't really talk too much about the base cases. The obvious one is when we reach the end of a word and we, well, when we reach the end of the target word, cause that's what we're trying to build here. So when I, our pointer is equal to the length of the target word, that means we reached the end. That means we built the word. We found a way to build this word. So let's return zero. There's another base case. What happens if our K pointer reaches the end? And what happens if that K pointer reaches the end, but this did not execute? So we put that if statement after. We say, what if K is equal to the length of a word, let's just take the zeroth word because all of them have the same length. If this happens, we're not able to build the target word. Oh, I meant to return one here. Let me not mess that up. But here, if we did not reach the end of the target word, but we ran out of characters to choose from, then we did not build the word, so we have to return zero. The last case is when we actually have the value already cached. So I'm gonna do that from the start. We know we're gonna have caching, and we know the key that we're gonna use. Here I'm using a hash map. You could also use a two-dimensional array if you want. We're gonna be mapping I, K, to the number of ways that we can build this target word starting with like this sub problem basically. So if we resolve this problem multiple times, we don't have to actually do all the recomputation. So we're gonna check is this key in our DP hash map? If it is, go ahead and return it. And I have a typo over here. Let me fix that before we go any further. Now we're gonna have the recursive case. And actually there's one that I didn't quite talk about in the drawing explanation, but it's not too complicated. We know we could use some characters at position K. And I'm gonna do that in just a second. It's possible that we don't have to use characters from this position. We're just trying to count the total number of ways. It's possible we could build the target word while skipping the characters at position K. That's a very simple case to code up. All we have to do is leave I the same because we did not find a matching character for the character at target at index I. And we're gonna increment K because we're deciding to skip this position. So I'll make that obvious. And this value is gonna be stored in our DP cache. It's gonna be our result. So I'm going to 
have that like this. We've initialized the value here. Now it's possible we could include this position. How do we do that? Well, the DFS is going to be I plus one because we did find a matching character for index I. So we're going to move to the next position and we used the character at position K. So we are not allowed to choose it again. So now we say K plus one. How many times would we want to call this DFS? Well, how many matching characters are there at index? index K for what character? Well, the character is going to be the character at target index I. So we say target index I is equal to C. And now we're going to use that C character as one of the keys for our count. So let's say count here. The key is going to be the index that we're at, which is K. K is the index of like the words and the character C, which is the character that we're looking for. So this tells us how many times does this character show up in the Kth position among any of the words. So this is what we're going to multiply by our DFS. And this is what we're then going to add to our DP because we're trying to count the total number of ways. We're not trying to find the maximum or minimum or anything like that. So I'm just going to copy and paste that and say plus equal to this over here. And then we are just going to go ahead and return that value we computed. But the one thing you don't want to forget is to mod it by the value that we have written all the way up here. This is pretty much the entire code. Let's go ahead and actually call our DFS. We're starting at position zero for all uh, both strings. And before I run it, I just want to quickly mention you could have not done this pre computation to find this count, this count over here. You did not need to do this pre computation. You could have a loop in here to do that. You could have gone through every word and then done this part, but that would decrease the time complexity. It would make it, well, it would make it less efficient for reasons that I talked about earlier which is why we are doing the pre-computation. So now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. At first, it might look like it's not very efficient. And the reason is because here we're using hash maps instead of using two dimensional arrays. It doesn't change the overall time complexity, but using arrays is more efficient because you don't need to hash the key. So it definitely improves the runtime, but I don't really think it's worth it because in a real interview, I don't think anyone would care if you're using a hash map instead of a two dimensional array, but you can use a 2D array. It just takes a bit more code to actually initialize it in Python. That's why I went with a hash map. But if you don't believe me, try replacing these with 2D arrays and you'll find that the runtime does improve, I think, to about 50% when I tried it. But I definitely prefer more concise code. If this was helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. It has a ton of free resources to help you prepare. Thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon.